Earlier this week, a federal judge ruled on a lawsuit about Donald Trump's Twitter account, and this might have, this might be a Pandora's box, I don't know. I saw a ton of wild speculation. Basically, this judge said that the replies, the comment section of Donald Trump's tweets are a designated public forum, and that essentially Trump can't block people. But then all of a sudden people started saying, what does this mean about Twitter's obligations? Can Twitter block people then because they're restricting people's access to a presidential, you know, a forum with the president? And things got so complicated that as much as I really wanted to talk about this, I'm not a lawyer and I don't understand half of the words in this judge's opinion. But Will Chamberlain is a lawyer and he's joining us today along with Emily Molly to talk about this case. And we're also going to talk about social media censorship and other issues that we're dealing with in the space of alternative media. This is the Culture War Podcast. Reuters reported that a U.S. judge in New York on Wednesday ruled that President Donald Trump may not legally block Twitter users from his account on the social media platform based on their political views. Donald Trump uses Twitter as an integral part of his presidency to promote his agenda, announce policy, and attack critics. He has blocked many critics from his account, which prevents them from directly responding to his tweets. So this story is pretty straightforward. It's, you know, basically Trump can't block people, but there's there's potential nuance to this opinion that I don't know about, maybe Will does, but there's another example. This is from the Journal Times, and it talks about how this potentially is going to affect other stories. So just a quick tidbit. This is from Madison, Wisconsin. After a federal judge in New York ruled that President Donald Trump violated the constitutional rights of those he blocked on Twitter, a Wisconsin case was given new life. On Wednesday, the Madison-based progressive group One Wisconsin now celebrated the ruling and brought attention to its own similar lawsuit. So I don't want to get into too much detail on that case, but I just wanted to highlight specifically that other people are seeing this suit, this suit and, and using it to present new arguments. So, Will, who is joining us, uh, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, I'm Will Chamberlain. I'm a lawyer and commentator in Washington, D.C., and the former executive director of Maga Meetups. And I'm Emily Molly. I'm an independent and freelance journalist based in New York. Okay, so for the billionth time, on the surface, you know, the way it's been reported, it's really simple. Donald Trump, you can't block people because the replies to your tweets create a public forum. But, uh, Will... I know that, I mean, you're a lawyer, so you probably understand this a lot better than us. Do you want to give us your thoughts and opinions, and we'll just start start there? Well, so that's one part of what is a, a fairly lengthy opinion. This is actually a 75-page opinion that this district court judge in the Southern District of New York issued um, that deals with a lot of arguments that the government was making about why the, uh, the plaintiffs in, in this case, people who had been blocked by Donald Trump, um, couldn't win their lawsuit. Um, one major argument is the fact that they simply didn't have standing, which is um, a requirement that traces back to the idea that you know the court actually shouldn't be issuing advi- what's called advisory opinions, i.e. In, in the United States, courts are only allowed to resolve cases and controversies. That's actually a constitutional requirement, Article 3, Section 1, if I remember my con law right. Well, so, so hold on, and, uh, hold on, you, because I think you mm-hmm. lost me. What, what does that okay. mean? Yeah, cause, well, because you're a lawyer. So, what does that mean as a controversy? Right. So uh, a case or a controversy is a dispute, right? Like people are, um, you know, essentially have adverse interests to one another. Somebody has been injured and the court can solve that dispute. Uh, the standing, as it's understood, has, has three elements. There needs to be an injury, right? The, the, the plaintiff needs to show that they've been harmed somehow. Uh, and it can be a very, very small harm, but they need to show some kind of harm, right? If you, have, you can't just, you know, come in and it can't be something that everyone feels, right? You can't come in as a taxpayer and sue the federal government saying, I don't like your policies, and since I pay taxes, I have the right to sue you in federal court to have you change your policies. You have to show that you've been individually injured um, to bring a lawsuit. Additionally, you have to show that the defendant caused your injury um, and that the court can redress your injury. Um, And this might, normally this is actually a really easy threshold to meet, but this is an interesting case in that because of the fact that they're suing the president and and demanding relief from the president, they're running into an area of of law and and essentially an area where it's very hard um, and there's restrictions on the extent to which district courts can order the president to do things. Um, So as a result, there's actually a question about whether or not the plaintiffs have standing, have the right to even bring the suit in the first place. Well, but it looks like they won, right? 
They won on the, on the on in the district court's opinion, but again, this isn't really going to do anything unless it goes up on appeal. Um, the reason being that uh, district court opinions don't hold binding presidential value. They don't they don't control what other courts do. Um, so, for example, this is this this judge is a judge on the Southern District of New York. Uh, the the government is almost certainly going to appeal the decision to the the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. If the Second Circuit makes a decision, that will be binding on New York district courts and the Second Circuit from then on. Uh, but this is not a binding decision, and and so to the extent that there's a slew of arguments that the government is making that are pretty strong, even if the court found a way to decide against. Um, President Trump, the, the Court of Appeals is going to get to review all of these questions again. And since these are all questions of law, they're not going to give any deference to the district court's decision on these questions. They're going to review them, what's called de novo review. And, uh, and that means that all these questions are going to be open um, when, the gov- when the government appeals, which it almost certainly will. So, so basically, they're going to review this on its own merits and kind of ignore the district court? Is that what that means? I mean, the, basically, they're going to just take the district court's opinion. If if it's persuasive, they'll go with it. But they're not they're not giving it any deference. Um, you know, and this is distinct from different types of review. For example, when when you're talking about factual determinations or things like whether or not to a judge correctly admitted evidence, you're looking at very different um, standards of review. For example, like a factual determination is reviewed for either plain error or sometimes even abuse of discretion. Um, and that means that that's the reason for that is because the appellate court is so far away from the actual trial and and doesn't really have a good handle necessarily on the original evidence and all the factors that went into that. They want to defer to the district court's decision. So even if they think it's somewhat wrong, they'll let it they'll let it stand. But when it comes to, you know, statements about what the law is, um, the district court, I'm sorry, the, the appellate court reviews those de novo, giving no deference to the district court. And the key holding in this case, the, the key holding that Trump's Twitter replies are a designated public forum and that Trump doesn't have the constitutional right to block people from his Twitter account, those are statements of law and those are reviewed de novo. Oh, interesting. Okay, so uh, I guess basically how this all started to kind of reiterate is that it, I believe it was a woman, was, is that she, she, yeah, she a said, you, yeah, a reporter said, she, you know, you blocked me, you can't do that, and then filed the suit, and other people joined on. I think mm-hmm. that's, yeah. right, that's, okay. So, just getting past that, what, what is a designated public forum? Is that, like, a free speech zone? Like, what does that mean? So, let me pull up the language really quick, because I actually mm-hmm. think this is worth doing. So, um, a, a designated public forum is a space controlled by the government that is generally open for public speech to fellow members of the public. And it's not necessarily owned by the government, but if it's under the control of the government, then the First Amendment protections can apply in that arena. Huh. Um, and so that's like, you know, uh, there's traditional public forums, which is, you know, parks, streets, that sort of thing. Designated public forum is to kind of recognize that there are areas where the government is creating a forum for people to speak and discuss. Um, that's not necessarily a traditional, that's not necessarily okay. like a park that it owns. Well, so this is, I mean, this whole ruling has kind of, I don't know, I'm just seeing a million different potential arguments based on what this opinion was. I mean, what what are the ramifications of a private company owning a designated public space? It, it's almost like, look, Donald Trump does control this space. The go- so there's a governmental control in the space that is below Donald Trump's tweets. But Twitter has control of that above the president. You know, is there any... Right. Right. So that's an interesting question, right? Because, and this is actually the point made by Noah Feldman, who's a professor of law, I believe, at Harvard. Um, uh, but he's a he's a noted First Amendment lawyer, and he thought this case was wrong. And he's a he's a noted liberal and a very harsh critic of Trump. But he thought this case was clearly uh, decided the wrong way, uh, because he his argument was precisely that that Trump is not ultimately in control of the uh, his Twitter account. Twitter is in control of Trump's Twitter account. And to the extent that Trump is able to block people on his Twitter account, that's a feature implemented by Twitter, withdrawable by Twitter at any time. And uh, that's just a feature of the service. And the analogy he uses is he offers the example of, say, somebody sued uh, Twitter saying that they had the First Amendment. Somebody is blocked by Twitter permanently, like Milo decides to sue Twitter for being blocked, saying that 
because the court has determined that Donald Trump's Twitter account is a public forum, Twitter's blocking Milo is actually precluding Milo's access to a, a public forum, which is impinging on his First Amendment rights. Yeah. Now, he argued, now, you know, Feldman argues that this would get likely get thrown out because the First Amendment only applies to state action, right? The, the First Amendment says the government shall not abridge the freedom of speech. Mm. So the first suing based on a First Amendment right requires that they're actually the, the government be the one depriving you of your speech. And, and so Twitter is not the government. But the fact that Twitter is in control, the fact that Twitter can block you really quit, you know, query whether that means it could possibly be a public forum at that point. The fact right. that one would be in a position to sue Twitter to get access to a public forum if they were blocked from the service entirely um, indicates that Trump isn't really in control of the service. So I, I think as a factual matter, um, I'm not sure that's, I'm probably, I think that's probably, that might be a mixed question of fact and law. I'm not really sure. But I think that will be a big problem for them on appeal, demonstrating that Trump actually does control the reply section of his Twitter account in um, a way. A another key argument is that one of the one of the arguments made by the government that was kind of, I think, brushed over by the opinion is that Trump didn't intend to create a forum for people to speak. He, in he created an account to speak himself. And part of the language and, and, and the precedent on what constitutes a designated public forum contains this idea that the government has to intentionally create a forum and a place for people to speak. Oh, um, query, I, you know, query whether or not he's actually did that by merely starting a Twitter account. Right? So It'd be which, one thing if he was. So go ahead, guys. Oh yeah, because he he created his Twitter account long before he had any plans before for Before he running. was a government official. Right. Yeah. yeah. But right. they they do argue in the opinion, uh, or they state that he's used it time and time again to make official statements. Yeah. Like, right. not through official channels, through his Twitter, so therefore he's acting as a government actor. So, uh, Feldman makes a good point that that ultimately shouldn't matter, uh, because that's a qu whether or not he makes official statements bears on the question of whether or not his Twitter, his tweets are official records that need to be collected under the Official Records Act and perhaps released under FOIA, although I don't think, I'm not sure about that, but, they need, but whether or not they're official records. But it doesn't bear on the question of whether or not he's created a forum and he, the government has created a forum. Now, you could argue, and, and I think they do, that because he's used it for official statements, he's acting not in his personal capacity as a speaker, but acting in his government governmental capacity. And so that means that it's a, it's state action, but it, that argument is slightly distinct. Also, he does have two Twitter accounts. He has the, the president, the POTUS one, and then he has his personal one, the real Donald Trump one. So I wonder mm -hmm. if that's arguably one is for well, the, the POTUS was created for the for, government. Yeah. I, I think you, mm -hmm. could, you could argue that outside of the argument for control, that is a space that was created, Yeah. but not for people to argue for official statements. So then you still kind of have that same argument, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah, Yeah. no, and you certainly will. And, you know, oddly enough, this actually isn't the first decision on um, web, like a president or a, a state official's Twitter account. There's actually a decision out of Kentucky, um, very, very similar facts. Uh, where a person who was blocked from the governor of Kentucky's Twitter and Facebook account sued him, saying you, you're depriving me access to a public forum by depriving was, me access to your was account. The, was there a ruling on that? Yeah, their ruling in that was they found in favor of the governor. They said one, it's wow. it's not a it's not a public forum. Um, it's uh, and this is the governor's personal speech. Uh, the government, you have no right to make the government, you know, the governor listen to you on a particular venue. Um, and this isn't a public forum. It's yeah. it's it's within it's it's Mr. The governor's personal account. So um, I, I think I, I personally feel like the ruling has to be wrong for so many reasons. Like one of the things I want to bring up is and I'll ask you, I don't know if you know this, but let's say Donald Trump decides to have dinner at a ball mm -hmm. at, at a big, big venue that has a ballroom and he decides mm -hmm. to give a toast. Right. Right. If he stands up in the middle of that privately owned restaurant with a ballroom and starts speaking and other people start yelling comments, is it now a designated public forum? And Donald Trump can't ask people to leave? Like, it's, it's, I'm, I guess I want to compare Twitter to a public, to a physical space versus a digital space. Can a business right. say, so, do, or, so I'll just say this, can, if, if Donald yeah. Trump is eating food at a restaurant, can that private business, are, are they obligated to allow people to come in and hear Donald Trump speak? Is Donald Trump in control of that private business? So, uh, I think that on that particular analogy to the private business, the, the argument would be that uh, Trump doesn't control 
uh, the business itself. Clearly, the business controls entry and exit, and it's its own place. So as a result, it's not it can't possibly be a public forum well, but, because right, right, to be right. a public forum has to be controlled by the government. And Twitter is. You've um, got to you've got to sign up and log in with credentials before you're allowed to speak. Yeah, but that means it's controlled by a, a, a private entity. But the, by the same token, the, the argument they make is or at least made in the opinion is that Trump does exert control over who is capable of replying. So they, they take a very narrow view of what constitutes the public forum. It's not Twitter as a whole. It's uh, the reply section of Donald Trump's tweets. And the argument is that he does control who can enter and exit that. And as a result, that would be distinct from uh, his, this, the, this restaurant analogy. Also, you're, you're, you're making, there's another kind of embedded argument that, that you made there, which is that you know, it's just Trump personally speaking. And if somebody heckles him, is he required to listen to them? Yeah. Right. Uh, and the... There's I'm going to say two, no. I'm going to say no. Yeah, I think the answer to that is no. Uh, but I think this is actually a weakness of the government's argument, oddly enough. They, they, they stress this point a lot, which is, you know, nobody you, you don't have the right to force Trump to listen to things. But the opinion makes clear that nobody's saying Trump can't mute people. Right. Like, right. They, you know, it's yeah. a nuanced opinion in the sense that it fully understands how Twitter, the functionality of Twitter. So. The, the court argues that, of course, Trump can't be forced to listen to anybody, but Trump can mute whoever he wants to. The question is whether or not he can block people, meaning he can uh, preclude their access to the replies to his tweets. And the question is not, can those people who are blocked communicate with Trump? The question is, can those people communicate with other people within those replies? Right, right, and right. that's the forum that they're being deprived of. That's the argument in the opinion. So let's say... That- so, so here's what uh, I think got everyone all excited. It's, it's the thing you mentioned before about Milo. Okay, they banned him, mm-hmm. and that means they're denying his access to a public space, where uh, to, mm-hmm. a public, to a designated public forum. If, l- let's just say hypothetically, the, the, uh, in, in appeals, they lose, and it's upheld that this is a designated public forum, can Twitter, say, like, it, is there any point at which Twitter becomes a privately owned public space? If you, you, like, if you're familiar with that Gosh. concept. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, this is this is where I, I really don't have a confident answer. And I, and I, from the things I've read, I didn't see like a really good answer. Basically, the the Feldman argument used this as sort of the argument at absurdum, right? Like why this is a bad decision because this can't possibly be right. How Twitter <laughs> could be forced to uphold the First Amendment rights of uh, the First Amendment rights no, that's, of, of well, well, hold on, hold on. No, I disagree. Uh, mm-hmm. During Occupy Wall Street. Zuccotti mm-hmm. Park, where the protest happened, it's a POPs. And that, that's a short, that's the, you know, abbreviation for a privately owned public space. And huh. they, they were not allowed to bar people based on their speech. They had to make sure the space was, they were legally required to keep it open to protesters. And so what Interesting. they, but what they were allowed to do was restrict certain behaviors. No tents, no sleeping, you know, no, you know, right. sp- spilling stuff on the ground. And they put up new rules within, you know, I think it was like a, uh, within the month. But a privately owned public space, at least how it's listed on Wikipedia, I'm not saying this is correct. It just says it is a space that is open to the public, but privately owned and legally. And because of that, it is legally required to be open. And Got there's it. a legal. So, so then what becomes interesting with this ruling is, is it possible then we are seeing, I mean, is this the first digital privately owned public space? Because social media is relatively new. I mean, this is precedent setting. We, we haven't had these kinds of discussions before. I mean, maybe right. like a little bit, but we're getting to that point where it's going to reach its, its tipping point. Sure. I mean, and, and the ultimate conclusion of this ruling is that Twitter owns a designated government public forum that <laughs> citizens have a First Amendment right to speak in. That's it's crazy. Um, you know, and, and if, you know, the, the logical conclusion would be that Twitter is violating people's First Amendment rights by blocking them now. Well, so let's let's I, I let, think that's hard to hard to resist that that conclusion. Let me try another another analogy, because maybe I mean, maybe it's the same thing. It's not worth saying, but I'm just gonna say it anyway. Let's say there's a, a big stadium and mm-hmm. on any given day, anyone is allowed to walk in and walk out so long as they obey the rules of the stadium and you mm-hmm. simply walk up, say your name and they let you in. Well, Donald Trump mm-hmm. decides to use the service the same way everyone else does. And while he's there, he's, he's talking and people are heckling him. If they keep you, if the owners of the stadium say you can't come in, is is that in any way violating your access to the president? In my opinion, no. You're like mm-hmm. the, the the president has a right to use a private business like anybody else, simply because he's somewhere speaking about things that might or might, might or might not be official. 
doesn't mean you have a right, right to go into this place. Well, it's it's like when he has yeah. campaign rallies, they'll oh they'll have, kick you out. Yeah, yeah exactly. you got they have security. Yeah, yeah. but if and you're not playing yeah. by their rules or you're a threat right. or something. I think that uh, the there's I mean that's actually a question that I think has been dealt with by the courts before. Um, the idea is that when a president's giving a public speech of that nature, he's expressing his own views and therefore state action isn't implicated, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not the government that's speaking and the or the government therefore that's creating this forum. It's the president in his in his personal capacity. Um, now, uh, you know, then so that that's that would be the argument there that 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 particular example wouldn't implicate state action. I mean, if if this is upheld, does that would that ultimately require Twitter to like they can't block people? This this, this is gonna. This I mean, is... it's so weird because that's I think that's Feldman's point, right? It leads to this bizarre statement. You found it's a public forum that Twitter owns, and it's that not Twitter a public forum, or... from, right? Which a but if Twitter owned blocks people forum. from it, but like, how do you sue Twitter for blocking people from a public forum and? Because the defense would be there, no, there's no state action, but in the opinion actually says this: the, the the inquiry about whether or not something's a public forum and whether or not there's state action should be coterminous, right? The idea is that if there's a public forum, it means that the government is acting in some respects and controls the space. So if they're excluding people from the space, that's state action. But then Jeez. Twitter's it's it's a it's like a, a Gordian knot, like it just goes you know, around and around and around. I think that ultimately that'll be why the opinion falls. This is, uh, you know, the other day, Will and I did a video about the Tommy Robinson stuff. And one of the things that got brought up was the law and technology. We, we've often talked about how the law and technology are kind of in an arms race where the law really can't keep up with the changing demands of, of, of new tech. And so mm -hmm. here we have one of these cases. But then, you know, we're going to come to a point where there's just no way to accurately deal, like, there's not accurately, there's no way to actually deal with this if a private, mm -hmm. if, if Donald Trump is using a service, if our, if our public speech and public debate is happening on a private platform, then there has mm -hmm. to be some responsibility to that platform for upholding certain values. You know, we're, we're, we, uh, Obama campaigned on Facebook. He's posting mm -hmm. ads on Facebook. These interactions are happening on a digital space owned by someone else. The diff, you know, and, and TV ads exist, commercials exist, but the public couldn't interact with those commercials. Now they can online, and it's creating the, this idea that there is a public forum. So you know, you mentioned yeah. uh, Feldman's argument, and from a from a, like a classical point of view, before the advent of this new social media, yeah, he's right. But at the same mm -hmm. time, now something is going to have to happen because we do not have public debates in the town center anymore. We do not have. But we don't have political debates at church around the water cooler. We have them on Twitter, which is owned by a company. Hmm. And what's, what's, right. what, what's really scary about this, and I want to use this opportunity to kind of start segueing into what's called Section 230, is that, mm -hmm. uh, and this is something I've talked about before, Twitter can delete people, can block political opinion. Facebook can do the same thing. And one of the biggest concerns is that these companies can restrict people based on their political opinions. So... Mm -hmm. Before I move forward, I guess uh, I want to segue into Section 230, but Emily, you did, you did a video about this. Do you want to briefly explain what Section 230 means? Yeah, sure. Uh, Section 230 is uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, uh, which is a, a piece of internet legislation that provides immunity from liability for providers and users of an interactive computer service who publish information provided by third-party users. So that means if you have a blog and somebody posts some kind of horrible thing in the comment section of your blog, you're not liable for what they said on your, on your page. And the same goes for Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, etc. Is So my understanding of this, basically it's, it's simple, right? If someone says some nasty libelous statement, they can't sue you. They can sue that person. <laughs> But my understanding is that this arose because there was a debate over whether or not a website was a publisher mm -hmm. of these comments, and as a publisher, should they be held responsible? So, mm -hmm. so there was recently an amendment to it, and this was in response to child sex trafficking and sex oh, trafficking right. yeah, yeah. in general. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Sesta and Fosta. Yeah. So the the amendments that they made basically, um, if if now now websites if they have an idea or a 
uh, if they think that people are publishing some kind of sex trafficking or human trafficking language, then they can take it down. Otherwise, they, they are, are liable. Other, yeah. Otherwise, well, they're liable. Right, right, right. And that and that's going to have a lot of. I don't that know. can't be the the way that's framed, right? It's more that they have. It would it has to be framed as such that they have the permission to take down sex trafficking without losing. Oh no their no safe no harbor no! They're 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 criminally liable. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, oh. Yeah. Okay. So this is this is a whole other issue huh. because right. okay. uh, we, we, we I did do like several videos on this and talked about it, but, but I don't want to get too much into the FOSTA SESTA side of this argument, but I will kind of elaborate because I think Got it is interesting. It. They actually said Backpage is responsible. Uh, Backpage was like Craigslist. It was the second largest online uh, classifieds ad system. And they said if, whether or not Backpage knew isn't the, isn't the issue. Having the site was enabling it. And so this is an exemption to the protection that – if your website is being used or believed to be used, you are liable. And what's what's worrisome wow. about this is that ultimately it means that, oh, come on, man. You know people are doing illegal things and trafficking on every platform. Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, of course they are. They use code words. And that means the government mm. can now hold Twitter liable. So there's a fear that this will lead to these uh, these sites, these social media sites, taking heavy action against people. Maybe maybe this is why uh, YouTube's cracked down so heavily on so many people, because they're worried mm -hmm. about the government holding them criminally liable. But I don't want to get into much of that. I, I, what I wanted to mention is that one of the original debates having to do with publishers was that if you are a publisher, you are uh, liable, right? So, so the idea is these people aren't publishers. The comments are uh, made, made by random users, and there's no moderation. You know, it's, it's, you post a comment, comment appears. There might be a bot that checks for spam. But what happens when Twitter says, we're going to remove the blue check mark from certain individuals? We're going to restrict access to certain political ideas. Hate speech, for instance, is not illegal. That is a political position. If someone says, I hate this group of people, and that's, that, that's their, you know, they want to vote against them, they're, it, or, or, you know, a better example is people like, uh, t well, we'll use Tommy Robinson, for example. He tweeted about grooming gangs in the UK, a statistic. And he got suspended for it. Twitter suspended mm -hmm. him for posting a statistic because they called it hate speech. Does this mean that Twitter actually is editing for, for edit, like editorializing the content of the platform, making sure people can only get access to certain information? So uh, I guess to clarify, the, the kind of analogy is the Wall Street Journal's comment section is exempt because people can comment. It's not – the Wall Street Journal is not controlling what you say. But the front page or any part of the website is controlled by editors who ultimately decide if something is going to be visible to the public. In which case, if John Smith comments, you know, uh, Kim Kardashian's a man on, in the comment section, that's, that's his responsibility. Wall Street Journal's not liable. However, if he writes an article and it gets published to the front page of the Wall Street Journal, now they are responsible because they have control. In which case, mm -hmm. I guess, you know, my argument is... In somewhat related to this discussion, um, if somebody tweets and Twitter says we're not going to allow specific conversations, are they not controlling the conversation? In which case, shouldn't Twitter be liable if people are posting libelous or, or you know, posting defamation? We're, we're in opinion I territory think, here, so I'm not asking for your oh, yeah. legal, legal thoughts. Sure, yeah. I think the answer should be yes. Um, and I think that uh, as a result, they... You know, I mean, and probably what needs to happen ultimately is that the statutes need to be modified to give Twitter the account to actually deal with real harassment. Um, you know, I, I think that. But again, it's it's one of those things that this, there's going to be a balance. The legislature's going to have to strike it. But ultimately, if Twitter is censoring political opinions, they should lose their their safe harbor protection. They're now they're now trying to show, promote a political agenda effectively. They they are and the, right and. And the characterization of hate, it as hate speech is just so fatuous. Like, it's not a category recognized under American law nope. at all. It's no one has a clear definition of it. Um, and it's it's just, it's a concept, it's it, it's sort of like assault you know, weapons in the same respect. Right, it's one right. of those concepts that, that's, you know, sounds nasty, nobody can define it. Um, and vagueness is actually a strategic tool on behalf of the people who wield the tool to... Yep. To censor the well, you know, they disagree with. I don't want to get into the gun debate because I've got a little anecdote, but even sure. now, the latest assault weapons ban proposal includes handguns, like semi-automatic mm -hmm. handguns. Basically, you're, you're the, a Glock 17, I, I, I'm not a gun expert, that's, I think that's what it's called, would even fall under assault weapon categories. I don't think any 
you know, average American thinks a handgun is an assault weapon. They're thinking mm-hmm. of rifles with extended magazines and things like that. Sure. I don't want to get into the debate, though, but we can see how far this goes. They keep pushing it. It's so vague. They can say, oh, this is, this is. Um, mm-hmm. So anyway, I was in the UK for an event. Uh, it was like Creators for Change. And it's where they brought in all these, these YouTubers to talk about doing social good and whatnot. And they talked about how they were implementing. This was a couple. This was like a uh, maybe year and a half ago, two years ago. They wanted to implement new policies for dealing with uh, hate speech. And so I raised my hand and said, "How do you define hate speech?" And then, like half of the room looked and they were like, "Yeah." And then people were like nodding, like, "Give us the straightforward answer." And it was interesting because these were the the lefties. These are the SJW kind of type people. I'm not. I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but these are the hardcore. They wanted a specific Mm -hmm. definition so they know what they should flag and things like that. And for me, it was kind of like, what can we say without getting in trouble, right? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, YouTube's response was patter, right? They had no idea. They didn't know what the definition was. They really didn't. Mm -hmm. They said generic, oh, don't target people of, you know, based on their identities, whatever it might be. It's, you know, be respectful. And and I'm like... People, people, you could tell people started getting upset. They were like, "Can you better define it for us? Because we we need to know what you're who you're going after." And they said, "Like obviously terrorism and white supremacy." Mm-hmm. And I'm like, "Okay, they they can't define it." And 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 this is problematic because as we've seen with Twitter and other platforms, you can say you know something like "kill all men," you can rag mm-hmm. on white people, and even though according to like actual legal definitions of race, gender, national origin, etc. Yes, men are protected. White people are protected. Uh, but to these social platforms, no, they're not. Right? So it's, it's not, there is no definition. It's basically a loose idea of don't offend groups that are oppressed and we, and who is oppressed changes every day. Yep, yeah, I agree with all that. I mean, I, I suspect- There we go, we're, we're done. You know, we all agree. It's we're, yeah, conversation. We're, yeah, right. I, I feel like that's, you know, this space at least has has pretty solid agreement on that. Although I don't know, Tim, you're 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 more of the left than than I am, certainly. Oh yeah. Um, I I, <laughs> but, I was having a I was having a pro choice argument. This is funny because um, you know, people are always like, Tim, are you conservative yet? Are you? I'm like, no. <laughs> I'm no. <laughs> sorry. Like, it, it's funny because we're having a discussion about the right to share ideas. My ideas, Mm -hmm. my political opinions, when I rarely give them, like today I got into a debate about pro-choice, which I almost never do, but uh, Mm -hmm. this this woman said that every argument that's pro-choice is emotional, not logical, and so I was like, okay, all right, I'm I'm stepping up. (laughs) That's terrible. I'm going to give a logical argument for it, and and it's it's really like an authority argument. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm I'm still pretty centrist on the whole thing, but uh, yeah, I mean, what's baffling to me about seeing the lawsuits against Twitter to, to seeing the censorship of certain political opinions is that it's going to be used against you, man. You know, mm-hmm. first of all, you're, you're a, you're conservative, right? Well, is it the safe? Yeah. But, say right. So. Okay. Know. And, and, and we can have lovely conversations and enjoy a, a, a beers and nachos and get along just fine. But there mm-hmm. are some people for whatever reason can't do it. And they actively right. want to like burn down the conversation, which, which is so weird to me. That mm-hmm. we we are on the opposite ends of the American political argument like spectrum. In in some ways, I'm sure we agree on a lot of things, and yet sure. there's an actual argument happening online that we should not have that conversation. That certain ideas should be restricted or banned. You know what I mean? That, that's where my fear comes from. It comes from the idea that I won't be able to hear what you think, and I won't, I won't be able to understand you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, people ask me what my political project is sometimes, and I really just want the culture of about 20 years ago, to be honest, you know, or maybe even fit 10, uh, which is just a world where we everybody was cool disagreeing with one another and, and, and still civil. Um, well, I, I mean, like there were, there were bombs going that. off. Sure, sure. And I, I don't want to put too rosy a view of the past. You know, that's a, that's a nasty habit. But it's, it's, by the same weird, token... Yeah. Uh, like it, even 10 years ago, I don't recall the culture being this way, uh, in terms of feeling, uh, many people feeling like silenced and, uh, many people feeling like political things are the basis of friendships. Um, that's a, that's a new thing. It's, it's sort of bizarre. And I'm pretty sure the statistics bear me out on that. Like if you look at, uh, the numbers for, um, you know, how many Democrats would be okay if their son or daughter brought home a Republican, um, 
they're they're pretty they're pretty low um, in ways that would be obviously be unacceptable if the question was based on race. I, I might I uh, might be totally misremembering this, but someone said someone there was like a tweet that got shared around that said I would rather my daughter date ISIS than a Republican or something, mm-hmm. like some ridiculous statement that obviously wasn't true, but. M- it's it's like if you're willing to even joke about that, like you hate Republicans that much. I think it was MS13, wasn't it? Oh, it was MS13. Yeah. That's yeah. what it was. that's what it was. Right. Yeah, right, right. It was. I would rather my daughter date someone MS13 than a Republican. It's like <laughs> they. Look, if liberals, if liberals want to make conservatives the bad boys, I'm all for that. That's fine. The bad boys. <laughs> Mr. Will sitting here with his uh, what is that? A, a, a plaid shirt and his black frame black frame glasses. You're you're officially the bad boy. Can be deceiving, my friend. Appearances <laughs> can be deceiving. You are now. More of a bad boy than MS-13. It's it's confirmed mm-hmm. because of this yeah. one person who tweeted. I, I need to get some face tattoos, complete the look. <laughs> there you go. I mean, uh, I guess while we're while we're in the vein of talking about social media, uh, I I guess before we get to deviate too far from the main core of this, the subject, is there anything else we should talk about in terms of Donald Trump and the and the Twitter thing? Well, Actually, there is. I just remembered. Will you mentioned there were other arguments? Did we did we talk mm-hmm. about that? The other we didn't talk about the seating arguments. Those are those are actually fairly interesting. I guess you know I'm a I'm a legal nerd a little bit still, so I, I kind of kind of find it fascinating when there's a decent legal argument. Um, yeah, yeah, let's hear it. The, the argument is that the there's not standing because the per, there's no defendant against whom the plaintiffs have standing. Um, two of the pl- defendants were actually dismissed from the case on this ground: uh, Sarah Sanders and Hope Hicks, because neither of them control. Twitter account, and so they can't be ordered to redress the plaintiff's injury. Oh, interesting. Um, right. Uh, but Dan Scavino does have a you have use of Trump's Twitter account, and Trump himself has use of it. But Dan Scavino didn't block any of these people. Trump did. So the argument that the government made is Dan Scavino isn't a proper defendant because he didn't cause plaintiff's injury. Um, oh. So the only proper possible defendant is Trump. But Trump is not a proper defendant because even if he is responsible for the plaintiff's injury, in this case being blocked from Twitter and having the inconvenience of you know switching to an anonymous account or something to read his tweets, uh, that cannot be redressed because you're not allowed to get an injunction against the president of the United States. Um, mm-hmm. that, that there's laws about that. And they're trying to skirt this by saying, oh, well, we're not gonna enjoin the president, we're just gonna have declaratory relief, we're just gonna say what the law is. Um, but the government, and I think as persuasive arguments on this point that that's just that's not um, that doesn't work either. That's essentially trying to do injunctive relief in name only, um, and and also it makes it sound very much like what's at stake here is an advisory opinion, right? That the entire point of this opinion is merely to state what the law is. But if you remember, like the role of the courts is to resolve case disputes, right, right, right a case right. or a controversy. And so I- if you're just if the court's just issuing an advisory opinion, it's not really doing that. So that's a ground it could get thrown out on on appeal. I just I just thought of something. What mm-hmm. if somebody was responding to Donald Trump and they said something that was hate speech but was legal speech and mm-hmm. Twitter banned them? Mm-hmm. So if this is a designated public forum in which they have a right to participate with the president but Twitter caused the injury mm-hmm. and removed them from the – can they – is that – I know it's like we talked about this. They're not a, they're not a state actor. They're not the government. But if the injury mm-hmm. is coming from Twitter, then does that mean there's literally nothing they can do? They can't sue Trump. Trump didn't do it. Right. Well, I mean, they wouldn't have standing to sue Trump, right? You would know, they have standing Trump to sue cause Twitter? Their injury. They would have standing to sue Twitter in the sense that they've been injured. Um, but the question is, like, do they actually have a viable claim? That's that's a separate question from standing, right? Standing is simpler. It's just do you have the right to even be in court? Yeah. Um, you know. Uh, but here, and although there might be an argument that they, that they because their injury isn't redressable because Twitter has the right, complete right to be in whoever they want because they're a private entity and, and the First Amendment isn't implicated because there's no state action. Uh, so we're sort of back to back to the discussion we had about 20 minutes ago. Well, so I guess we can start getting into the, what's the right word, speculative and philosophical. Should okay. Should there be new legislation... Should, so there's been arguments that these social media platforms should be public utilities. All of mm-hmm. that's worrisome to me. The idea of giving government more control and more power worries me because I don't I don't trust the you know the monopolization of power in any capacity. I think when we see Twitter and YouTube and Facebook behave the way they do, that is an example of the monopolization of power. They've become so powerful 
they can shut down mm. political opinions. Is the re- is the re- is the is the, re- is the re- right reaction to say let's give more power to the government to deal with it, or is it something maybe um, it's it shouldn't be a power of the government, but it should be something that kind of pulls back the power of Twitter. I don't know. I don't want to rant. The basic idea is public utility argument, Internet Bill of Rights argument, and any kind of potential news le- new legislation to regulate these social media networks. What are your thoughts? Do you think we should do something? Yeah, uh, I think one good idea is potentially to inc- add a political affiliation as a protected class under uh, civil rights legislation. So you know, you're not just like Twitter you can't discriminate on the on, on the basis of sex or race or anything else. You start saying they're not allowed to discriminate on the basis of political opinion. Hmm. Um, yeah. That would uh, mean that 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 has the there's an elegance to that in the sense that it puts political opinion and embed it in what is already a pretty broad and deep uh, well of case law on, on civil rights law. Obviously, it would have to be adapted to the context of, of well, political discrimination. But of the ideas I've heard, it's the simplest a legislative fix that doesn't require this enormous like legislative undertaking to figure out exactly what they can do and, and, that, and that what exactly they can do will ultimately be left to the courts to kind of hash out over well, I, um, a period yeah. of time. I, f- I feel like ultimately you would end up with a Supreme Court ruling specific on, on this because mm-hmm. what if your political opinion is that you want to uh, – it's, it's on the death penalty, for instance. So you mm-hmm. literally say execute these people, right? Mm-hmm. I want these people executed now. They should all be killed or something, right? Mm-hmm. At what point are you stepping over the line of cl- creating a clear and imminent threat or just having a political opinion? If, if you're engaging in something like – maybe I'm phrasing this wrong, but the idea is if there is a political opinion that could, could mm-hmm. potentially cross the line into libel slander or a crime, mm-hmm. would that be protected? Well, no, probably not um, because uh, we still have you know, the, the questions about what constitutes defamation, slander, et cetera, coexist with – um, the First Amendment already, right? We, we already have a, a rule of law that says that, that you have freedom of speech, you have the freedom to express yourself, period, uh, but the government can regulate you in this instance. That would, It would just sort of be extending what is already a pretty deep well of case law in, in the context of the government, state action, and then it would kind of naturally, I think, be embedded in the private sphere, right? Where, where you would say, yes, you don't have the right to discriminate on the basis of political affiliation, but um, that doesn't mean you have to tolerate this speech that uh, we've all, the government has already determined is actually unlawful speech. What, what if your political right? opinion is ISIS? What if your political opinion is ISIS? Yeah. Um, then you're probably engaged in unlawful speech um, external to uh, the, the question of discriminating a political opinion. And so maybe you would then argue that the statute um, conflicts with the First Amendment, right? The, the, the pro, or somehow, actually it wouldn't conflict, it would, it would work with it. Um, I don't know. I, so, I so, think. Uh, well, there, that, no, sorry. That, that statutes would conflict with one another, right? That the bans on on terrorism, incitement of terrorism, would conflict with this this civil rights discrimination um, right, prohibition. Right. I see. I and see. So, that makes sense. Yeah. Right. Like so, and the way that courts do that is they try and make sure that they just try and make sure that they harmonize. So they would interpret they they'd interpret the statutes to sync up with one another in a way. So they'd say, look, I mean, obviously, we don't favor implied repeals, meaning that you would pass this political affiliation statute and thus you are repealing all of your statutes that uh, ban harassment and incitement and, and all of these things. And so they'd say, well, this just means, you know, companies can't discriminate on you on the basis of your political opinion, but that harassment and incitement and all that are still unlawful, um, so, even if those are nominally political opinions. I guess uh, the way I kind of understand it is if you were posting over hate speech uh, like your political party want to take adverse action against a protected class, then you're already in violation of the Civil Rights Act, to, right? Like you can't. I mean, right. I, well, you can certainly advocate for stuff like that. So, so I have a potential hypothetical. Then let's say they, we never get to the point where political affiliation is protected. Mm-hmm. What if you, Will, were mm-hmm. at a restaurant and you were wearing a MAGA hat, and they said, "Hey, we don't want you Trump supporters in here." What, mm-hmm. what, what would happen if you said, "Oh no, I don't support Trump." I worship him. I it's my religion. Uh, that is, I think, a thorny area of uh, 
the First Amendment law and 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 there's and you know freedom of religion. Obviously, I'm not I'm not familiar enough of that area to know. I, I mean, obviously, it, that hits on a thorny area of you know what what religion religious beliefs are genuine. You know, can oh, you just invent tricky. a religion? Yeah. So I mean, we're yeah we're in a very tricky area, right? And, I mean, we, I'm reminded Scientology, right? Like yeah. Scientology actually has a better claim to this stuff. But well, no, no, hold on. Um, uh, Pastafarians. Oh, flying spaghetti. Yeah, monster. flying spaghetti monster. They wear sieves on their head. And they're all, they've they've won court cases allowing them to wear spaghetti strainers on their head in their ID photos. Now I think that's silly because if you want to travel to a foreign country, they're going to start questioning you. But they've won these, and so it's you know when, whenever it comes to civil rights law, I always talk about how dangerous it is to keep mm-hmm. expanding it because at what point are you not protecting the innocent anymore and allowing people to put spaghetti strainers on their head? I mean, I get it, they're making a political point; they're not trying to get an advantage or anything. But right. in this instance. You could go into a restaurant that has a dress code, and when they say you mm-hmm. can't wear that, you say, oh, this is my, you know, uh, barbo. It's a religious garment. I can't take it off. Are mm-hmm. they legally required then to say, okay, he said so? One of, the, one of the issues there is that that's one of the, the problem, in a sense, results from the fact that religion is a constitutional protection and not really subject to statutory reform, right? Like, you if there was a statute that was allowed Pastafarians to do whatever the hell they wanted and, or that had been interpreted the way by a court, Congress would quick, quickly fix it, right? The, similarly with Scientology, I think Scientology wouldn't have its tax exemption if that were a matter of statute and not a matter of first Ame- of the First Amendment. I, I, I feel like I, it's, it would be dangerous, in my opinion, if a court said, mm-hmm. your religion is obviously fake and I'm not going to allow it, right? I mean, that's why yeah, we have true. the First Amendment. And so then true. there's, you know, when I, when I hear about Basically, I heard about all of these stories where people went to Starbucks and they said, what's your name? And they said Trump. And then Starbucks was like, get, all the employees are getting angry. In New York City, the, the human rights law is specific that if they discriminate against you, it's a fine. If it's willful discrimination, it's $250,000. In which mm-hmm. case, if Trump supporters all started claiming they weren't supporters, they were worshipers, and it was their religion, could a court really deny someone? You know, like, I guess if there's one person who has an, a religion that only exists within them, is it a protected religion? Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know. That's that's just an area of law that I'm not I'm not super fluent or conversant in. Um, I, I, mean, I know I know it's a thorny question. That's what I do yep. know. Yeah. Um, I you think know, I, that uh, that's that's a reason to include political affiliation as a protected class under civil rights legislation, so we can avoid all that silliness. Yeah. You know, but but just then say. but then I imagine people start making everything political, right? Like, isn't every like, yeah? Can't everything be political? Like my political class. Uh, are you familiar with copamism? Do you know what that is? No. This no. is, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to poorly define this because I'm not an expert, but it's the general uh, Pirate Bay kind of religion. The idea mm-hmm. that information should be shared by everyone all the time. And so all of your digital assets should be shared with everybody. They made it, right. a, they made it a religion, so it would be a relig- religiously protected act, I guess. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm mischaracterizing okay. it. That's how it was explained to me, and, they, and this was in Europe. And it's huh. copamism. I don't, I don't know what that means. Or hmm. I, I'm, Again, I'm probably getting it wrong, but this is a general idea explained to me that people have used these Western civil rights protections to their advantage to be able, like, for, in it for, and it's piracy. This is, like, actually right. know, stealing digital assets and then sharing them for free. Yeah, which I'm sort of glad is, has really dissipated. That's, a, that's one of those problems that I didn't think would get solved, but kind of has when you think about well, it. Well, not it's with China. China. True. Yeah, they're stealing everything. That's true. And then but, it's, you know, it's, I'm thinking it's, of like video games and music. I'm actually paying for those things now. I yeah, didn't use yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who did? Um, Who did? Exactly. I, I always paid for everything. And uh-huh. uh, I want to make and sure everyone knows. suggesting that you would break the law is totally appalling and contemptible. I realize that. And, and, never, and no one never should do any it. such insinuation. Never do any of that stuff. You always pay full price and play by all of the rules. Don't violate any of the terms of service. Tim's trying to not get another and, strike. <laughs> and, and, and make sure you're upholding the law and, and doing nothing illegal. Yeah, okay. I think you got He's, yourself covered. But hold on. What if it's your religion to do that? I, I'm not going to ask in a million. <laughs> My religion is to violate the terms of Twitter. You can't tell me I can't do it. It's constitutionally protected. What if, uh, well, no, actually, hold on. Let's, let's, let's kick it up a notch. What if your religious belief required you to make a specific statement that Twitter thought was hate speech. Dude, we're, we're, we're so far in the twilight zone, I don't even know where to begin. Yeah. I, no, but... I, 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 so, so, look... If Twitter yeah. thought it was hate speech, there's, like, multiple elements there. If your religion required you to make a statement... Well, I think, again, state action applies, right? It's the government that's not allowed to abridge freedom of religion. 
So since Twitter is oh, no, 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 no. I think that was settled. No, 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 no. Uh, civil rights law in New York and California, and I, I'm not, I don't know the rest of the states, uh, uh, require... Yeah, yeah, civil rights acts. Yeah. Yes, they require that any public accommodation offered to the public has to be offered equally. If an individual is allowed to say, um, um, blessed be to you uh, and our father full of grace, etc., on Twitter, and that's a prayer, mm -hmm. if your religion has an extremely hateful prayer, like, you know, death to all spaghetti monster worshippers. Like, yes, yeah, specifically, you know, like, or something like death to the infidels. Like, a specific reference to a group of people saying our religion holds true, our prayer that we say every day at the the, the dawning of this, uh, at the at the at the fall of the sun, death to everyone who is X. Like, you know, Twitter is going to be like, you can't do that. But if it's your religious belief, they can't take that down. It's mm -hmm. a violation of state and. Uh, Civil rights law and, and federal civil rights law too. Huh. You know, look, I, I grew up. You know. I grew. I grew up in the hacker community, and what that means is, we think about all of these gaps in security, and you mm -hmm. know, when I hear about right. you, like w w when I hear that's like uh, you can't define gender in New York City because it's mm -hmm. uh, it's it's considered self identity, self image, w in which case you can make up a word, make up an image, because they want to protect everybody. They have uh, 31 genders, and within that, there's actually repeats. Like, they say female to male is a gender, and FTM mm -hmm. is a gender, and that means the same thing. Uh, right. But based on the actual, I looked up the, the, the codes, I went through the actual law, it's just gender is self-image, in which case you could make up one. You know, they've, they've essentially, in an attempt to protect everybody, they've actually stripped everyone's protections away and, and created right. this potential instability. Right. Maybe, maybe that's yeah. a solution. Maybe we need to start a religion, uh, a, like a free speechy in religion. Requires mm. us all to say something that's like potentially offensive every day. Right, right, yeah. No, I, uh, the hate speechianism. <laughs> no, 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 no. Not hate speechianism. Just like, um, what's a, what's a better word for, for like proclaim, proclaim, pro, proclamology. Oh, oh all the proclamology. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, let me know when you let me know when it's finished. I'll, I'll I'll take a look at the brochures with. We, we've, we've kind of rambled on and, and drifted away from what we should, we should be talking about, but we did talk a lot about the opinion in the court case. I guess the final question that we should say, is this going to force Trump, this decision, to actually unblock people? And a after this, is this going to require every politician to behave the same way and unblock people? So uh, I think the answer to the, both of those questions is no. Uh, it, the first question, will it force the president to unblock people? Um, the relief is declaratory. It's it's a statement of what the law is, and it actually does not impose any, uh, you know, duties on the president. The, the the court tried to say, well, we assume that government officials adhere to the law, so since we've said the law, we assume they will simply come into compliance with it. But there's no injunction, and the president has indicated that he intends to decline to comply with the order. So I don't, and I don't see how that could be contempt of court or anything like that, because there is no order to comply with. There's just yeah. a statement of the law. I mean, he's the president. Um, Could they hold him in contempt of court? Uh, good, good question. Probably not. My guess is, crazy. given that they can't, you know, that I think, and partially this is why, you know, I, Scalia wrote an opinion on this, why you don't get to sue the president for injunctive and declaratory relief, because it creates this exact sort of bizarre confrontation between district court judges and the president of the United States, which which is to be avoided if, you know, it can be, if it can be. Well, then, uh, the second Oh, yeah, Sorry, yeah, yeah, no, 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 you go ahead. I don't want to. All right. You said the, the second question was, will this force other people? Uh, I mean, not not yet. There are people bringing lawsuits like I know uh, Mike Cernovich is attempting to bring a lawsuit um, on his behalf, suing the people who have the, the government representatives who have blocked him uh, largely on the same grounds that they are denying oh him access to a to a designated public forum. Uh, I would, you know, like. The, the ramifications of this decision, if it actually gets adopted by other courts and eventually, if it, especially if it gets adopted by a court of appeals or the Supreme Court, could be substantial. Um, it, it really could change the way that government officials have to interact with their Twitter accounts. Um, but, but and not, not, it's really hard to see what will happen to Twitter itself, just because, right. again, it, it creates this Gordian knot of law where, you know, Twitter is responsible for a designated public forum, but it's a private company, so shouldn't hey, be sued. You know, but there's precedent yeah. for it with Zuccotti and other privately owned yeah. public spaces. So there yeah. was uh, even the um, I forgot it was called, but beneath Deutsche Bank, not too far from Zuccotti, it was indoors, and it was still hmm. a privately owned public space. 
So you had all the, you know, the hippy dippy occupiers basically living in there. And at, at you know, of course, the Deutsche Bank and these private le- the, the the private entities that own them tried to get rid of these protesters. They mm-hmm. couldn't. They weren't allowed to do it. Uh, Interesting. It's yeah. This it was is a federal lawsuit. I really want to read more about this. I don't this is actually. Some I I don't. I I believe it was a lawsuit. I'm, but again, I'm not an expert. But uh, yeah, I mean, hey, maybe this is something we, uh, we should we we probably should have dug dug more into. But uh, Zuccotti is a really yeah. great example. Yeah, I, I believe there was a suit that was lost. That the mm-hmm. courts were like, it is a, it, it's privately owned, but it's designated for the public. You have to keep it open, and you can't remove people because of their speech. In mm-hmm. which case, I don't know if I'm ex, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say I'm excited for the courts to uphold this decision, but I will say, this reporter who started this whole trend, now you've got Cernovich mm-hmm. doing it, other people doing it. That's 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 the can of worms already. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. And then. I can only imagine that when it comes going back to the Section 230 argument about being editors mm-hmm. and shoot like, I mean, look, they removed the blue check marks from people for political reasons, you know, so mm-hmm. we need I think we need to see this clarified by the courts. Uh, safe harbor protections based on the activity of these social platforms and their political decisions to block people based on their politics. You know, hate speech mm-hmm. is a political position, not a law. And mm-hmm. so we need to see that. But we also need to see. You know, if people can, if Twitter can be sued for violating someone's access to the presidential forum, mm-hmm. like it is the presidential public forum, it's the president speaking to the public. There's the issue, like the issue I mentioned, of private spaces where our political discourse happens. And if the courts uphold this, we need that suit. But we also then need to see another suit beyond Section 230 for Twitter being responsible for the speech of its users if they're going mm-hmm. to be acting in editorial capacity. So. We are we are potentially standing on the uh, the edge of a cliff here, about to mm-hmm. jump off, and I don't know if it's going to be good or bad. Do we know what the next steps are going to be? Will do you do you know if there's going to be an appeal? Do you know if they're going to fight it or? I would be shocked if there wasn't an appeal. Um, I mean, Trump's not complying, or rather, it's not even that he's not complying; he's just ignoring the declaratory judgment, um, and uh, it's the kind of thing that the government has lawyers on staff who appeal this sort of thing. So, you know, it's that he doesn't pay any money. It's just government lawyers will appeal this. But I mean, we, don't, we don't have any set dates or anything, so there's no hard no. path forward. No. I mean, there's like a, basically, I think the, the rule is you have 60 days from the from the judgment to file a notice of appeal. Um, All right. Well, there we go. So, so we should hear something from the government within, I don't know, the next couple months about I wouldn't be surprised if it's sooner than that but they might take their time because when they said when they file the notice is when they kind of start the clock on briefing and everything else and so they might want you know they might pick a time that'll fit more easily into their schedules given what their current right their current calendar looks like all right well I guess we've about run out of gas on this subject so thank you everybody who hung out listened or watched you can follow me on Twitter at Timcast make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel youtube.com forward slash timcast and you guys want to give your information before uh, we sign up sure i'm on twitter at moms molly m-o-m-e-s-m-o-l-l-i yeah i'm will chamberlain on twitter and periscope w-i-l-l-c-h-a-m-b-e-r-l-a-i-n all right well uh, will thanks for the conversation on this issue it's very interesting um for everybody who watched we do the podcast every sunday at 4 p.m And also on my YouTube channel, I have a video every day up at 4 p.m., which covers kind of similar topics, but it's much shorter. So again, thank you all so much for hanging out and listening, and we will see you all either next week or tomorrow.